Well, it's always dangerous to draw attention to any particular guest, but I'm so thankful for those of you guests who have joined us during our time. And, and uh, I'm looking to see, did the McClung, McClung brothers have to leave? They have been here faithfully. Uh, I just want you to know these are dear, dear uh, friends of our ministry. Uh, you that have been a part of ministry teams, Brother Joe McClung pastors a little church up along the holler on uh, the turnpike. Was drama team at his church? Do you recall? Yes, drama team was there. It's a place that you have to just stop and you can't go any further. And uh, I remember the first time I ministered there, and God has used them in a great way. And they've been here in the services faithfully. Just wanted to say uh, what a blessing it is to have them. And those of you that are guests, I'll not put you on the spot, uh, but thank you for being here in that regard. I do have some quick announcements as we start this final hour of the morning. Uh, first, uh, those of you who park around the chapel area here normally, please have your cars moved uh, after the service this morning, even probably before you go to lunch. So that way this area can be cleared through the rest of the day today and this, uh, this evening as well as then for commencement tomorrow. So people that park in this area, please uh, just move your cars. And be aware, of course, uh, I think most of those are McCarroll Hall residents uh, that have cars parked here. Uh, you won't be able to park in your parking lot as they're working on the placement of the sign down there. There's some progress of that even going on. So if you have nothing else to do uh, through the breaks of the day, you can watch as that progressively gets into place and uh, just ask the Lord to give safety and just uh, helping that to come together in, in the various sections as they place that. There is a service this afternoon at 2.30 for our Seniors, uh, as they place or as they present a service, it's called our senior service or senior uh, program that they have. Uh, they will be uh, uh, caring for the entirety of that. This is a required activity for our campus family, so make sure students and staff that you're present for that. I would ask you to be here early before 2.30 because the service will start with them having a formal processional coming in and their regalia. And so please make sure that you're in place so you don't interfere with that particular start as they have that processional service coming at the start. So 2.30 is the start of the service. Be here prior to that in your places. Sunday attire, an event that we want to honor our graduates as we share that service with them. And so be aware of that. Tonight I want to just let you know I'm going to ask us to be prepared to recite our verses that we've learned on the year. And so we'll make that part of the evening service as we have that opportunity this evening and uh, anticipate our service together. By the way, there will be nursery facilities available for the class, uh, senior class service, and then of course the evening service tonight, as we mentioned before. So let's stand together, and we're going to have a song as we move further into our afternoon, or I mean our morning service now, as Mr. Kale comes to lead us as we sing. Our relationship with the Lord is truly a sweet thing. It wasn't necessarily we were born into the right family, but he chose each of us individually to be his children. So chosen as his children. Chosen by the Father's mercy, set apart to serve His Son, sanctified by His own Spirit, praise the Holy Three in One, saved by resurrection power, shielded in His faithful love. Now no enemy can tarnish my inheritance above. I'm born again. I'm God's own chosen child of mercy. Born again. What love and grace. Father, keep me walking worthy till I look upon his face. Till I look upon your face Fixed upon this hope completely As obedient children fear For the Holy One who called you Purchased you with blood so dear Born anew from seed eternal 
His loving kindness heard, laying aside all tasteless yearnings, crave the true and living word. I'm born again, I'm God's own chosen child of mercy, born again, what love and grace, Father King. Till I look upon your face, till I look upon your face. Built on Christ, the sure foundation, as more free from guilt and shame. He is fitting us together as a house to praise his name. We are chosen as God's people, called from darkness into light. Oh, what mercy now entreats us to proclaim this glorious bride. I'm born again, I'm God's own chosen child of mercy. love and grace. Father, keep me walking worthy till I look upon your face, till I look upon your face. And if you'll take your hymn books, hymn number 611. In number 611, no matter what we may face, we know that he hides our soul. We're going to sing stanzas 1, 2, and 4. Stanzas 1, 2, and 4 of 611. last, but we can look forward to when we're finally clothed and in his presence. When clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions in He hideth my soul in the cleft of 
together. Father, we thank you for your protection and care and the great salvation that we enjoy being born again in Christ. And we thank you for revealing your glory to us in Christ and in his word, and specifically the gospel of John. We're eager for the message, and we pray you would teach us and grow a deeper faith in us through your word this morning. We ask that protection and care and blessing for those who are traveling in to be with family and those who are here, we're rejoicing in that. And now we wanna pray your protection and care and blessing over specific seniors. We pray for Becky Shizmanski and we ask that you'd bless her coming marriage to Daniel and their new home and life and her desire for direction and service, growth and trust in you, we pray you would bless her. We pray too for Matthew Allinger and his marriage to Julie next weekend. We ask that you'd bless their marriage and specifically their pursuit to vocational missions with biblical ministries worldwide and in Utah. We pray you'd guide them, bless them, grow them in you that they could be used for your glory. We pray for Connie Calderwood and we ask that you'd bless in her new teaching job in Maine. May it be a ministry for your glory and offering to you. Use her, Lord, we pray, to impact young lives for the advance of the gospel. And we thank you for all of these seniors. And ultimately, we pray, Lord, desiring to glorify you, the one who is able to keep them from falling and to present them faultless before your glory with exceeding joy. Do these things for your glory, we pray. And with thanksgiving, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I know the morning has been filled with challenge and opportunity to have our hearts enlarged and stretched and convicted and encouraged. And I know that as uh, Dr. Johnson comes with the message again, that that will be our opportunity this moment. Uh, I'd like him as he comes, if he would, to just share uh, a couple of thoughts as to what his uh, sort of, uh, as it were, Greatest ministry lessons, and I love, you know, springing. I don't tell them I'm doing this, so he's got to be doing this spontaneously. Give him a moment here. Uh, some great ministry lessons that you say, if I were to advise these students as they go different places this summer, uh, lots of different settings, camps and internships and uh, other, other opportunities of ministry, if you were to say in a couple of, of, of just uh, guidelines, what matters most as they move into ministries this summer for the Lord? and then as you come and share God's Word. So that's your assignment. We'll see how spontaneous and extemporaneous he can be here. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. A. Concentrate on lesser quantity to achieve greater quality in the long run. Make disciples. I have found that uh, in the long run, much more is accomplished by following Jesus' formula. And so, uh, even though I enjoy preaching to large groups, I always try to be involved in some kind of discipleship relationship, whether it be with a new believer or with a um, younger pastor or with someone interested in ministry. And I have found that that kind of discipling and mentoring is um, how Jesus reproduces his church. And so um, I hope that you'll find someone that um, you'll be able to have a one-on-one discipleship relationship with. I find that uh, in ministry there are a lot of discouraging things to deal with. There's a lot of crisis counseling to deal with. But you put in front of me a seeker who 
is, wants to study the Bible or a new believer who wants to grow, and I find that motivating. And that'll, that, that will um, just spur me on. And so uh, lesser quantity for greater quality, and in the long run, greater quantity as well, because Jesus knew what he was doing when he said, go make disciples. And then, uh, as I said in the first session today, um, keep your eyes on Jesus, which means keep your heart in love with Him on a daily basis. He's worth it. He's worth it. I want to share a couple of fun videos with you. They're only about a minute and a half each, and uh, they do have a point. They're amateur videos, so let me set them up. Um, my youngest nephew, this is my youngest, I have, I have five brothers. We were six boys, no girls. I'm brother number four. Brother number six, the youngest, has four sons. And his youngest is getting ready to graduate from high school this year. And uh, his name is Gavin. And he'd be embarrassed that I was showing these, but that's okay, he'll get over it. Um, because they go back about five, six years. When he was in middle school, he had this thing about building with dominoes. And it got more and more elaborate. So the first one is 3,000 dominoes. Let's see how Gavin did and if the creation works. All right, now if there's one off, you know, the whole thing's messed up. So uh, we're going to cheer and hope that Gavin makes it all 3,000. Mom and Dad are filming. He's nervous. All right. It's going to pick up speed. Are there any that are off? Will uh, there be any mistakes even as you near the end? He made it. All right, give Gavin a hand. All right, so uh, that was his successful domino creation. The next one, if we could just go to the next video, the crowd starts to grow, you know, his parents, friends started to hear about this. And so eventually he was covering whole rooms, but this one's still on the table. Uh, yeah, there's more guests here. I didn't get a number for this uh, nominal creation, but a little more elaborate. All right. And the question is, will everything work? Well, he's still setting up. What are you doing, Gavin? What's it? <laughs> Older brothers are giving him advice. Some of you built some of these in your past somewhere, maybe when you were in middle school. All right. See, he's got his cheering section now. All right, he made it. Good job, Gavin. Why do I show you these domino creations? Because it illustrates to me the fact that the Bible says the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his own will. And we believe that God has a plan far more important than setting up dominoes, far more elaborate when I was a student at Appalachian Bible College, uh, I was captivated with uh, theology proper, books like The Knowledge of the Holy, a book that came out in the 70s when I was here, like Knowing God. And uh, Dr. Joseph Pinner taught us this definition of omniscience. 
God knows all things. Of course, you say that's omniscient. He knows all. It doesn't stop there. God knows all things, actual and possible, in one act of knowing. God never says, you know, I never thought of that before. And he knows all things actual and possible. He knows what would have happened if I'd never been born. He knows what, you would, have happened if, what would have happened if you'd gone to a different college. He knows what would happen if Vladimir Putin died today or if he didn't. God knows all things actual and possible. And the Bible says that God's sovereignty is his right and power to do all that he decides to do. We sang about that this morning. In absolutely everything that needs to be done to bring about his purposes, God sees through that it happens. Dr. Anderson said that means that we should say this is a good day because God has a plan. Providence is his purposeful sovereignty. It is decisive but not coercive. Are you tracking with me? God allows some things to be accomplished through the free will and choices of creatures, but God remains sovereign. It is decisive but not coercive. Providence is the hand of God in the glove of history. It is the purpose that God has in all things. Genesis 50, 20. I hope you know that verse. I hope it's important to you. Joseph to his brothers. Joseph who had been abused. Joseph who had been sold as a slave. Joseph who spent time in prison said, you meant it for evil. God what? Meant it for good. He had purposes. It was intentional. And when we wonder how can we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, them that are the called according to his purpose, it's because he has purposeful sovereignty. Now we're getting to know Jesus better, the one we serve. We've met two individuals who had a relationship with Jesus, Samantha, my name for the woman at the well, Geraldo, my name for Herod's nobleman, the man we're going to meet today the Bible does, in chapter 9 in this session, the Bible doesn't give his name either. My nickname for him is Sonny, and I hope that you'll see why before the end of the message. John 9. In John 8, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And then in chapter 9, he heals a blind man to show that he is the light of the world. Chapter 9 is followed by chapter 10. You say, Pastor Mark, that's not very profound. Okay, but chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And in chapter 9, we see him shepherding the man who was healed as a good shepherd. And so the connection from 8 to 9 to 10 is very intentional. As John has selected Seven sign miracles, water to wine, healing from a distance. Here is number six. Number seven will be Lazarus come forth. And he has selected seven I am statements. Uh, I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. This is right in between. Lord, I'm confused. I'm disappointed about what's come into my life. I feel like I have just one piece of a jigsaw puzzle that I don't know how it's all going to fit together. But then the Holy Spirit reminds you, hold it. God's got the box lid. He's got the big picture. He has a purpose. We'll see that demonstrated in the life of a man born blind. So what lessons are we to learn from this unique chapter concerning Jesus, the sight giver? First lesson, understand our Savior's sovereignty over sight. Now Jesus passed by and he saw a man who was born blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, 
Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Do you notice Jesus' compassion? Verse 1 says he saw a man born blind. We learn later that this man was a beggar. He was probably a fixture in the community there in Jerusalem, perhaps near the Temple Mount. And his disciples saw that Jesus saw. That's how Jesus was. How many times when we meet someone or see someone with a disability, is it easier to look the other way or to go right by in our hurry like uh, the priest and the Levite on the Jericho Road in Luke 10? But Jesus took time to stop and he saw a man who'd been born blind. Verse 2, the disciples are full of the human questions. They're asking about causes. He was born blind. So what specific sin caused him to be born blind? Was it his parents' sin? Was it perhaps, as some of the Jews thought, that he could have sinned even in the womb? and was struck with blindness before he was born? They are asking for an explanation. Jesus doesn't give them an explanation. He does deny their explanation. And we learn some truths about sovereignty. One of those is to beware of faulty assumptions. Who sinned, this man or his parents? No. And no, it was not either of those. The disciples fell into the same trap that the friends of Job fell into. And that so many times we are pointing out our explanations, our, our answer to the why question, which of course makes us, like Job's friends, miserable comforters, not really helpful to people. And here are the disciples. I, I assume the man born blind is right there hearing this conversation with his sensitive ears. But Jesus would not give them an explanation, but points to God's purposes, even in suffering. What Jesus said is, no, the cause was not his parents' sin. The cause was not his sin. Now, we know that in one sense, all sickness or physical disability is caused by the sin of Adam and Eve that's been passed down. And Jesus knows that. Jesus believes that, but he doesn't go there. There are some times that, 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 that a, a, a problem is caused by a specific sin. I mean, if, uh, if you rob a bank and you get shot in the arm and they have to amputate, well, you caused it, right? <laughs> but... Usually, that's not the case. Jesus doesn't go with an explanation, an answer to the why question. Jesus goes to God's purposes, even in suffering. By the way, parents of those born with disabilities need to know this. What challenges parents face who don't abort that disabled child. And yet, I just read statistics in, in preparing this message that in America today, 80 to 90 percent of children with disabilities are aborted. It's wrong. Back on Sanctity of Life Sunday in January, uh, dad stood up and gave his testimony from the previous year about how they were told to abort little Candace. 
discovered in the womb that she had uh, trisomy, I forget the number, but a complicated genetic disorder. Might not even survive till birth. The doctor said you should abort. They said, no, we're leaving this in God's hands. Candace was born. Their family loved her, held her, read to her for one month, and then she died. Difficult. But God was glorified because of leaving Candace's life in God's hands. I remember about 20 years ago when a couple in our church received the news that their unborn child had serious issues, including blindness. And uh, little Mariah was born. Turned out there were no problems other than blindness. And now Mariah, at age 20, is a beautiful, well-educated, blind young woman living for Jesus. Oh, this is not easy. We need to know that God has purposes. That the works of God should be revealed in Him. As I was preaching on this, uh, I, in our, one of our services, I had Bobby stand. Bobby's blind. He was born blind. His mom has had a wonderful testimony in raising him and caring for him, even into adulthood. But Bobby's got the joy of the Lord, and when you see him at church, he, he's beaming. He, he, the works of God are shining through his life. You see, we know the story that this man is going to be healed and that the works of God are going to be displayed in that way, but it's not always healing but the works of God, the purposes of God, are always on display. Jesus accomplishes His work in this broken world. That's what verse 4 and 5 are about. I must work the works of Him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Of course, His hour has not yet come. It's still day. He's still performing miracles. He's still teaching. But the darkness is about six months away at this point when He will be arrested, tried, hung on a cross. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But you know, in the day of darkness, in the day of His death, He will accomplish His greatest work. If you ever question whether God can use evil in His plan without being responsible for the evil, without causing the evil, but using the evil to accomplish his purpose. Just look at the cross. Greatest crime ever committed, the crucifixion of the Son of God, the innocent one, the just for the unjust, accomplished the greatest work of God in our salvation that we've been singing about this morning. Thank God for his purposeful sovereignty. And oh, what a bedrock that gives us on which to stand, on which to help others, My wife has taught me so much about uh, trusting the sovereignty of God. Part of her life testimony, you see, her mother died when she was five years old. She remembers as a little five-year-old kid, oldest child of three in the family, going to wake her mother up, as she, sometimes she did in the morning, and this morning her mom wouldn't wake up. And so as a little five-year-old, she just went back to bed, and a little while later her dad got home and find out, found out that her mom, his wife, was not just sleeping, she was dead. And so, what would help my wife as she aged and processed what had happened to her mother as her father eventually remarried and she was raised by a stepmother and had stepsisters and all the things that happened in her life, the thing that got her through was knowing the sovereignty of God that he has a plan. Then when she was 21 years old, she graduated from Appalachian Bible Institute, three-year program. Dr. A remembers those days. She was headed to Luxembourg as a single missionary. She had uh, been in the missions program. She was excited about 
going to teach children in Luxembourg as a missionary, and that summer was her candidate school and internship in Philadelphia with WEF Ministries, now BMW. But the weekend before she was supposed to leave, her parents were having marriage problems she didn't know about, and it came to a crisis, and her ride to Philadelphia fell through, and she was going to have to get a flight. She called the mission on a Saturday. Her heart stressed about what was going on in her parents' life, called the mission, and someone answered the phone and said, well, give me your name. And they looked at the list, and they, she said, I'm going to need to be picked up at the airport. And they said, well, you know, I see another problem here as well. We, they haven't been able to found, find a church where you could do your internship. I think God is telling you not to come. She hung up the phone, and her life was on hold, and her dreams shattered. She went ahead and went to uh, another college and got her teacher's degree. And during uh, those semesters, uh, someone from that mission was on the campus and said to her, why didn't you ever show up? She said, well, I called the mission and they told me not to come. He said, what? He went back and checked the records and they, to this day, could never find out who answered the phone on that Saturday. In the meantime, she went on and got her teaching degree, had one school hire her so she could pay off a little bit of debt. That was Greater Beckley Christian School, at which time I was a student at Appalachian Bible College. We met at church. We got married, and now she's been a pastor's wife, not a single missionary in Luxembourg. I'm really thankful. <laughs> and she is too, most days. I don't know what random situation will happen in your life upon graduation. But you need to know as a bedrock on which you build your life that God has purposes in all that he does and all that he permits. You can trust your sovereign God. Second lesson, understand our Savior's ability to give sight. When he said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. He anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay, and he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. It's down the hill, about, about three-block walk from Temple Mount which is translated sent, and so the sent one is sending the blind man. So he went and washed, and he came back seeing. Jesus is the sight giver, and uh, Sonny can now see the light. Now, what's this about the spit and the mud? The, the word literally means he needed the mud, like you would need dough in making bread, and, and, and he anointed the eyes. You know, sometimes Jesus just did a miracle by speaking the word. Go, your son lives. Other times he used means, or he laid on hands. Uh, it, it wasn't magic, it was, it was purposeful. I don't know all the reasons, but a guess would be that he wanted the blind man who didn't communicate with, by, with what he saw, but did tactily feel the mud to have an opportunity to exercise faith and to go and wash and then see. And so the opportunity for faith was provided and the obedience of faith was exercised and the miracle of sight was accomplished. Jesus has all the power needed to heal or deal with any situation. Amen? Sometimes he does, but he may not. And then we need to know that he still has good purposes. Third lesson, witness our Savior's power to transform the one receiving sight. See, Jesus is about changing hearts and lives, not just physical comfort. And he is going to deal with this man, but in the process, this man is going to grow in his testimony. 
he gives what I'll call, first of all, a clear testimony. Verse 8. Therefore, the neighbors who had previously seen that he was blind and, and they knew that, is this not he who sat and begged? Someone said, this is he. Others said, no, he's like him. It's a mistaken identity. But he said, I am he. Therefore, they said to him, how were your eyes opened? He answered and said, a man called Jesus. That's about all he knows about him. Made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go wash in the pool of Siloam. And so I went and washed and I received my sight. They said, where is he? He said, I do not know. A testimony is simply telling what you have experienced. What did Jesus do for you? What have you seen, heard, felt? You don't have to have all the answers, but you can tell what happened when you met Jesus. And that clear, simple testimony illustrates for us, just say what Jesus did. I uh, like the phrase, we need to live out loud. As we live our daily lives, uh, to, 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 just, to just be willing to talk about God in any given situation and see if God opens the door for more. It's a beautiful day. Yeah, God gave us a good one today, didn't he? And see if the person might respond as you live out loud. A testimony is just what Jesus has done for you. But it, it progresses. Verse 13, they brought him who was formerly blind to the Pharisees. They're going to check it out with uh, the religious authorities that a miracle has happened. Now, it was Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Eh, uh-oh. Jesus didn't, you know, what day it was. Couldn't this waited till Monday? Yeah, he knows. Remember that he has purposes in all things. Then the Pharisees also asked him who had received his sight. And he said, or asked him how he'd received his sight. And he said to them, he put clay on my eyes, I wash and I see. See how simple this is? How clear this is? How confident this is? Therefore, some of the Pharisees says, this man is not from God. He does not keep the Sabbath. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. They said to the blind man, what do you say about him? Because he's opened your eyes. He said, he is a prophet. His testimony is progressing. First thing he said was, the man Jesus put on the mud, said, go wash. And I see. Well, evidently, he knows enough about the Old Testament to know that prophets can do miracles, and so he is assuming that he is a prophet. The man called Jesus, he is a prophet. And I love the confidence this guy has. The Jews did not believe concerning him that he'd been blind and received his sight. Jews here meaning Jewish religious leaders. Until they called the parents of him who received his sight, his sight, and they asked him, saying, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered and said, We know this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know. Or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He's of age, ask him, he'll speak for himself. For his parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews agreed that if, the Jewish leaders, remember, that if anyone confessed that he was a Christ, he'd be put out of the synagogue. It's the word excommunicated. That was a big deal in the Jewish culture, religiously, socially, otherwise. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So... They called again the man who was blind and said to him, Give glory to God. This man we know is a sinner. He answered and said, 
Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that I was blind, and now I see. Don't you love that? A testimony does not have to have all of the theological answers or all of the issues that we cannot solve, but it can be clear and it can be confident. Once I was blind, now I see. I love that. Um, that's why I call him Sonny. He can not only see the sun, he can point people to the sun. What's your testimony? Once I was fill in the blank, now I can fill in the blank. I doubt if anyone here was once blind, but now you see. But what was it like before you met Jesus? Once I was addicted, now I'm free in Christ. Once I was depressed, now I found joy. Once I was fearful, now I have confidence. How'd that happen? A man called Jesus. Let me tell you about him. What a great example this is of uh, our testimony. May it be a bold testimony. Uh, we don't have to have all the answers, but may we, as it says in Colossians chapter Four, make the mystery of Christ clear as I ought. Or Ephesians 6, in opening my mouth boldly. Boldness is not rudeness. Boldness is confidence and being unashamed. Now he says this, this, he's from God. No one, no, no one uh, who, who, who's doing this kind of miracle unless he's from God. Now, Jesus will come to him. Jesus will shepherd him. Jesus will reveal himself more fully to him, and the man will worship and have faith not only in the signs, but have faith in the Son of God. But this will be a persecuted testimony. They eventually do excommunicate him. They kick him out of the synagogue. But praise God that Sonny met Jesus. Old gospel song, sang it when I was a child. The whole world was lost in the darkness of sin. The light of the world is Jesus. Like sunshine at noonday, His glory shone in. The light of the world is Jesus. Come to the light. It's shining for thee. Sweetly the light has dawned upon me. Once I was blind, but now I can see the light of the world is Jesus. No darkness have we who in Jesus abide. We walk in the light when we follow our guide. Ye dwellers in darkness with sin-blinded eyes, go wash at His bidding, and light will arise. No need of the sunlight in heaven, we're told. The Lamb is the light of that city of gold. Come to the light, it's shining for thee. Sweetly the light has shined upon me. Once I was blind, and now I can see. The light of the world is Jesus. If we could speak to Sonny today in heaven, he would say to us, oh, it was grand to get my eyesight back for a few years on planet Earth, but far better. I've for almost 2,000 years now been in the presence of God, seeing His glory in person. Because Jesus opens spiritually blind eyes. And that is what he will do for some to whom you take this good news, God willing, even this summer. And so can you truly say, one thing I know, that though I was blank, now I am blank. Once I was on my way to hell, now I'm on my way to heaven. Once I was separated from God, now I am His very child. I hope you can all say that. If there's even one listening, you can by faith come to Jesus because His Spirit is here. He died for your sins, rose from the dead. Ask Him to be your personal Lord and Savior. He will hear that prayer and change your life. 
you'll have a testimony. And to all of you who are in the family and have had your eyes opened, not just can you say it, will you say it? Just to tell what Jesus did for you. Well, what if he doesn't heal me or heal my child in this life? You can still trust his good purposes. You can still say the works of God are being shown. And the most important thing is the spiritual healing. Because if he loved you enough to die for all of your sins, he cares about your every need. I love Romans 8.32, don't you? After Romans 8, 28, that all things work to, we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God, that are called according to His purpose. Romans 8, 32, He that spared not His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him freely give us all things? God is good to His children in all ways. And goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell, say it with me, in the house of the Lord forever. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for how real you are, for your love, for your care. I pray that every one of us, very soon, perhaps this week, perhaps even today, will be able to give a testimony to someone that needs Jesus. God, open the door and we'll speak. Would you make that promise in your heart right now? Lord, you open the door. You give me an opportunity to witness. And, and I'll tell someone about Jesus. Lord, you love to answer that prayer. Pray that we would see that happen through our lives. And God, that we would trust you with every detail, come what may, in the Savior's name. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. I did not know the challenge he was going to share during this hour, but how appropriate to sequence it from what we closed the previous hour in thinking of someone that you want to see come to Christ or praying for someone that has shared that with you. Let's ask God to help us be those who are used to give sight to blind eyes. I thank God for the light of his word, and I trust that God will encourage our hearts through that. I also want to just say as we more or less bring this portion to a conclusion, let's pray for God's work even for those that may be joining us yet today and tonight and tomorrow who will be on our campus who do not know the Lord. Uh, some of our graduates, friends, and family members Oh, that their eyes might be opened as they are on the campus of our college setting to have the light of the, of the glorious gospel. You know, the, the, the scriptures are clear that uh, the God of this world hath blinded their eyes, lest the light of the glorious gospel should shine. And so thank you for this wonderful reminder about Sonny. I hope that you will remember that name as you think of this message. Let's stand together. We're going to be uh, dismissed with prayer. Again, just remind you again that the uh, noon meal will be at 1210 instead of at 12, and so we'll have a little bit of a break here. But faculty members and administration members that are part of a, a photo session that comes, please make your way to the crow room uh, to take a picture for the uh, uh, school year. And so you know that detail, but just remember that as you gather there, instructions will be given as you get there for that occasion. And then this afternoon, 2.30, please again make your way promptly uh, in, a, in a head of the, of the procession and so that that way we can honor our graduates and our occasion to just even honor them as we would have that opportunity to share in the service that they will be presenting. Then again tonight, uh, join as we come at 7. I know that we'll have some additional guests. Please uh, do your best as campus family to move to the front sections here so that way we can have the accommodation of our gathering. And I would just ask that you will ask God's blessing as I will be sharing God's word with you tonight. And thank you for your prayers. Let's close with prayer and then we'll move in our directions for the remainder of the day.
Lord, we thank you for the light of the glorious gospel. We thank you that you are the light of the world. But we also remind our hearts that you have assigned to us, ye are the light of the world. Let our light so shine. And so may we find ourselves reminded that you are indeed the great sight giver. And Lord, in the midst of this, there may be even uh, those in this gathering, students or possibly guests or staff, who have circumstances before them in which they need the, the light of your guidance. May you just assure them of that certainty of your provision. Now, Lord, we ask for the continued direction of the day. We do pray for those of our uh, graduate friends and family members that will be joining for the service this afternoon and then through the occasion for commencement tomorrow. I pray that there might be just a real radiance of your presence that's easily observable. And Lord, if there are those among them that have never trusted you as Savior, may the need of the Lord Jesus be so, so clearly sensed in their souls that that very occasion of their being here will draw them to you. May they trust you as their personal Savior. Lord, thank you again for your word. We ask now for your blessing as we continue in these hours together. May we please you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You are dismissed.